Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Steve and I'm at Knox Farm State Park with Bill. Good morning, Bill. Morning, Steve. We're here on an overcast but warm late October morning. Yeah, it is fall. Yeah, I don't it's know. kind of abnormally warm for. Yeah, it's uh, like 285, oh. 290 <laughs> degrees. Kelvin? Yeah. <laughs> so about 55 degrees out right now. Yeah. Uh, F- Fahrenheit, I should say. <laughs> Which goes without saying. But it is a beautiful fall day. Right, right. Walking through the woods, mm-hmm. lots of leaves on the ground. Yep. And so this is the 12th episode ever. Wow, really? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> of the field guides. What we're going to do today, and over the course of any future episodes, is give you the experience of what it's like to be out in the field, in the woods, and on the trail. For each episode, we pick a natural history topic, research the science on that topic, get sick, <laughs> yeah, uh, and then head out to a natural spot and share with you everything we learned about that topic. Now, Bill, do you mind if I introduce this one? No, go right ahead. Okay. Ready? Ready. weed every day. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so... Uh, that was, um, friend of the show, uh, Dr. Dre. <laughs> uh, yeah. That was impressive, Stephen. Nice. So as, as that remix, uh, implied, this episode we're going to be talking about... Pokeweed. Yeah. Vital uh, Laca Americana. Mm-hmm. So, Bill, do you want to tell the audience why we're even talking about pokeweed? Sure. So, when Steve and I were trying to figure out what topic we were going to cover on this episode... We were thinking about fall topics. We knew we were going to release it in November. And we were thinking back to our episode on fall color. Episode 2. Episode 2. So I should say Steve was actually thinking about that. And he had come across in his research for that episode that pokeweed is different in terms of its pigments than um, most of the, the plants you talk about when you talk about color. Because most of our plants, especially those deciduous trees whose leaves change color... Their pigments are anthocyanins, um, a member of the flavonoid, flavonoid group, mm-hmm. right? But in pokeweed, you have a different set of pigments. Yep. You have the betalins. So there are two types. There's the beta-cyanins. Those include the reddish to violet pigments. And then you have the beta-xanthins, which mm-hmm. are pigments that appear yellow to orange. Right. You're never going to find the betalins with anthocyanins. Right. And there's really only one group of plants, one order, right? The pink order. Right. Yeah. The karyophyllase? <laughs> or f- Karyophyll... Oh. Ka- <laughs> Karyophyllase? So you have your pinks, carpet weeds, you have amaranths, like spinach and uh, beetroot. That's really where the etymology for beta cyanin comes from. The beet beetroot. plant. Beetroot, yeah. yeah. Cacti as well. And then there's some carnivorous plants, and uh, a lot of the, the members of this order are succulent, too. So what I was saying before is, although anthocyanins... You know, they're broadly distributed among most plants. Mm-hmm. The beta cyanins have replaced anthocyanins. In, in the, just this one order. In just this one order. With two exceptions. Did right. you see this? I did. Okay. Yeah, so what were the exceptions? The karyophyllaceae, the pink family itself. So that's where you're going to get your pinks, your chickweeds, the spurries, the campions. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the... Oh, man, I didn't practice saying this I one. Know. Do you want to try? The... Mulliganaceae? Yeah, that's what I would think. Yeah. So those are the carpet weeds, more or less. I think one thing worth saying is that there is some research that indicates, like the anthocyanins that you're going to find in maple leaves and most of the deciduous tree leaves, the mm-hmm. beta-cyanins do seem to have some kind of antioxidant properties. They're really helping protect the leaf and mm-hmm. keep the leaf, or whatever plant part you're talking about, right. lasting longer. Yeah. So there was a study I found from 2015, just last year in food chemistry, uh, that looked at the betalins in pokeweed, and they did find that the study demonstrated that beta cyanins will be useful as natural pigments to provide defense against oxidative stress. Oh, okay. I want to get to the more interesting parts, at least personally to me, to <laughs> pokeweed, because sure. man, this stuff's poisonous. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, poisonous to people and some animals. <laughs> Oh, I don't care about people. <laughs> Steve is what you call a... Uh, Sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the okay. word. Misanthrope. That's it. Oh, misanthrope. I like misanthrope. it. Misanthrope, yeah. So when I'm a uh, otaku misanthrope. Uh, oh, that's right. Someone who's into Japanese... Uh, Japanese culture. So right. I've gotten my second uh, label in this podcast. <laughs> a misanthrope. 
All right, so do you have anything else about the beta science? And this kind of goes back to what Bill was talking about with phadolins only really appearing in one order of plants. That's incredibly important. That's a prominent example of uh, chemotaxonomic importance uh, for secondary metabolites uh, in plants. What do the you mean by secondary metabolites? Primary chemicals or primary metabolites. Those are things that have to do with the, the growth and reproduction of plants. Okay. And secondary metabolites are things like toxins and tannins, uh, waxes, resins, um, oh, carotenoids, okay. and, right, right. and anthocyanins. <laughs> yeah, I can never <laughs> say that right. I always get it wrong. The fact that these only appear in one group of plants, it's a really important example of evolution, like taxonomy and evolution and everything. Right. So I thought that was important. So why don't we talk about what the plant looks like for people that, uh, that may not know. Okay. You're usually going to find this plant... Uh, along edges, mm -hmm. do you agree with that, or, or disturbed sites? It likes full sun, I think. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Like you're not going to find it in the middle of the woods unless you have a, a nice opening in the middle of that. Right. Wood. Now I say full sun, but what I really mean is exactly what you said: edges, or it has to be near something like a perch or something that a bird can hang out over. That's right. <laughs> Because that's pretty much the main way this plant gets around, or its seeds get around. Yeah, you're not going to find these grown in the middle of a cultivated field. No, no. <laughs> I mean, you could, you could, and, and there are cases, I'm sure, but for the most part, you're going to get it where the bird droppings are accumulating. And this is a native species. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a perennial, so it's going to return every year. It grows usually four to six feet high, so it's pretty tall. And it can get up to 10 feet high? I was going to say, I had 3 to 10 feet high. Right, but yeah. usually, yeah. when you run into it, it's going to be anywhere between 4 to 6 feet high. Yeah, we saw like a 5 foot one on our way in. Yeah, we did. So it usually has a, a red or a purplish stem as the plant gets older. Right, it starts greenish and then gets more red. Right. Maybe maroonish as it ages. The one we saw earlier today, definitely more maroon. Yeah. So there's an upright, erect central stem. A thick, thick, thick upright. Very yeah. thick. So I was looking at in John Eastman. We mm -hmm. keep mentioning John Eastman in, our, in yeah. our episodes. He has the book of... Field and Roadside. Field and Roadside. One. So in his description of this plant, I love the sentence he used, the taproot itself is imposing. <laughs> so I thought that would be a, a great band name, Imposing Taproot. <laughs> imposing Taproot. <laughs> <laughs> you just never hear those words together. So the, the taproot is fleshy and white. Uh, he said it's sometimes six inches across. Yeah, at the, the crown, top. right, That's right where it's crazy. Comes out, yeah. So uh, the leaves are smooth edge, so they are entire. Yep. But wrinkly. Did you see that they can get up to 16 inches long? No, holy cow. And then the, the flowers and the fruits develop in, let's use a botanical word, <laughs> racemes. Yeah, a raceme. Yeah. Right, a flower cluster with the separate flowers attached by short, equal stalks mm -hmm. at equal distances along a central stem. Right. The flowers at the base of the central stem develop first. So it's a long, slender group of flowers coming off of a central stem. So the flowers start out green, and then they turn white, but they don't have petals. They have sepals. Yep. Those are the, the parts of the flower bud that are concealing the bud. Correct? Concealing the petals, y yeah. And then when the bud opens, very often the sepals then are the parts kind of under the flower. Right. If right. the petals are large and showy. Sometimes you can see them from above, and right. sometimes you have to look underneath the petals to find them. And sometimes they're not there at all. Right, and in, yeah. but in certain plants, the sepals actually perform functions similar to the petals. Right, like orchids would be one example. They only have three petals, but I believe they have three sepals as well. I'm pretty sure that's what you'd consider tepals, where you can't really tell the difference between the petals and the sepals. All right, yeah. so it has five sepals that look somewhat like petals. And then talk about the fruits. So they start green. They kind of look like they're ten-parted. They almost kind of look like one of those little pumpkins you would buy at a store for yeah, like a decoration. They almost look flattened. <laughs> yeah, kind yeah. of flattened, and they have these ridges dividing it into ten parts. Yeah, indented. Yeah. They mature from the base of the raceme and then work towards the tip. So usually you'll see the green young fruits, and it'll transition to sort of like a rose, like a pinkish color. Yep. And then it'll be that bright black purple yeah i don't know why i want to say bright because when you think of black you don't really think right of but it's because it's bright and dark at the same time right it's yeah. so weird i was talking about that they were 10 parted mm -hmm. only for a little while when they're fully mature they really expand they fill out sort of like a blueberry but you don't want to eat them yeah <laughs> we'll talk about toxicity don't eat them. yeah and the raceme is really heavy it, right. it, when the fruits start developing you really get this drooping character if you're trying to come up with a comical 
picture in your mind. Just picture those little mini pumpkins that you buy at the store and just to have them attached to a plant and really just like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree, really <laughs> dragging the thing down. Drooping down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said 10 parted, but I should have also said 10 seeded. There are 10 seeds? Yeah, 10 oh, seeds okay. in each fruit. Deck carpet. Deck <laughs> You're just making up words now. Yeah. So, We've reached that point in the podcast where Steve's making up words. I think I deserve it, actually. <laughs> I, I think I can start making stuff up now. Yeah, so uh, there's 10 seeds, and they're often spread by birds. Often? Um, I think that's the major. Well, yeah, so it is the major, but some mammals do like them as Let's well. Let's talk about that, though. I've found anywhere from 30 to 40 species of birds feed on this. And a lot of common birds, too. Things like catbirds, brown thrashers. Yeah. Lots of our common birds. I even read that it was a major part of their diet. Especially during migration. Because mm -hmm. that's when the berries of pokeweed are. Yeah. We should say, because the berries start to come out early to mid-August. Yeah. And then it continues producing berries into November, really. The one that we went by, there was still very young berries. Right. There. So it's, it's odd that this plant has such a long fruiting cycle. I think it was in the winter birds episode. We were talking about things that the birds would eat during their winter migrations that would help them deal with that oxidative stress That's that right. all that flight puts on their muscles. Oh, yeah. These berries, we know they have an antioxidant in them, right. the betalins. I did not do research on this. So you um, actually I'd love to look back at that study and see if pokeweed was in it because we weren't even thinking we were going to do a pokeweed episode That's back right. then. So let's talk about the other names of this plant for a sec. Oh, it has a man. lot, right? Yeah. So pokeweed depending on where you live and where you're listening to this uh you may know it as poke berry poke root ink berry mm -hmm. uh, virginia poke or just poke yep i came across pigeon berry american nightshade that's confusing yeah yeah definitely american spinach bear's grape mm -hmm. the uh, slightly racist indian greens i was gonna ask you <laughs> did you see shoke i found skoke Oh, I wrote Shoke. Maybe I did it wrong. That's eh, probably called that, too. Common <laughs> Shoke, names yeah. you never know. Did you see Redweed? Yep. Red Ink Plant. Mm -hmm. Poke Salad. Yep. So S-A-L-L-E-T. Or? Polk Salad. Right. P-O-L-K. Right. Salad. And like Valcor Island, this could have been a very important <laughs> plant, <laughs> or at least common name in American history. Our 11th president, James Polk. <laughs> James K. Polk. <laughs> he was wearing, um, uh, he supporters. had all his supporters uh, wearing Polkweed, <laughs> or sorry, Polk salad <laughs> on their lapels. Um, I guess it's sort of like a campaign button right. or something. Yeah. I haven't looked at that specific election, <laughs> but maybe that's what pushed him over the edge, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the Polkweed. Yeah, yeah. It was a great marketing tool. Yeah. <laughs> so you know why it's called Polk salad, though, right? I don't know the salad part. I, I don't know if, if that's an old English use of the word salad or something. Well, in uh, a lot of areas, especially down south, they eat a lot of the leaves. Oh, you just got to boil it, right? Yeah, you have yeah. to boil it. You have to change the water uh, three times, three mm -hmm. changes of water. And, but it blows my mind that uh, people eat this and apparently eat quite a bit of it yeah. uh, at certain times of year because it is a pretty toxic plant. So what got me on this train of thought about toxicity was when you mentioned that some mammals eat it. Mm -hmm. I just found it interesting that so many birds eat it. There are mammals that eat it, like raccoons and bear. But then there are domestic animals that you mentioned, horses and sheep, that when they eat it, yeah. they get sick and they can die from it. Yeah. So it blows my mind that in the group of mammals, there are quite a few that can eat it, no problem, and then quite a few that can't. It seems like the animals that we like to use for things like <laughs> sheep and cattle and horses and whatnot. They've, <laughs> they've evolved not yeah. to be able to survive eating pokeweed. Yeah. And I tried to find research into that, and I really couldn't find anything yeah, I didn't about why anything. that is. Yeah. But folks, that goes to show you, I've seen in some horrible survival-type TV shows, oh, if you're looking for wild plants to eat, just watch what the animals eat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Completely not true. That, that they must See birds be... eating poison ivy and pokeweed. That's right, that's right. <laughs> So no, don't eat the, the pokeweed berries. Yeah. And did you see that the toxins can be absorbed through the skin? Yeah. So I actually found uh, one site, the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center. Mm -hmm. They were advocating that since this plant is so toxic and that people have gotten sick from it, some people have died from it, not often, and that farmers consider it somewhat of a nuisance because it can kind of work its way into fields, that it should just be eradicated. Holy cow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was a little extreme. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is poisonous, but 
you know, there's lots of plants out there that are poisonous. Right. Um, and as we said, it's such a valuable food for many of our bird species. I don't know. We should just get rid of pokeweed across the board. You only say that if you're worried about the well-being of your loved ones or something. And I, I don't really care about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a misanthrope, as we've already established, right? Yeah. So the most toxic parts of the plant, from what I could find, are the, the taproot, mm-hmm. and then the stem, then the leaves, then the berries. So okay. the berries are the least toxic. But if you do happen to eat part of the plant, it's an emetic. Do you know what an emetic is? I actually don't know. It makes you throw up. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it usually starts about two hours after it's been ingested. Usually if death occurs, it's due to paralysis of the respiratory organs. Oh. Yeah. So you basically suffocate to death. Eastman said for accidental pokeweed poisoning, Appalachian homeopaths recommended drinking lots of vinegar while eating a pound of lard. What? Yeah. And then he went on to say, raising real questions, perhaps, as to which demise might be preferable. <laughs> <laughs> so would you rather die from pokeweed or eating a pound of lard? Pokeweed, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Probably quicker. I don't want my last moments doing something disgusting. <laughs> Not purposely disgusting. I mean. yeah. All right, so you were going to talk about the allelopathic? Yes. Allelopathy is a word that we're pretty familiar with, but, Bill... Are you familiar with autotoxicity? Autotoxicity. Something poisoning itself? Heck yeah. Yes! <laughs> so they actually tested this autotoxicity in the lab. I found a paper from 1988 from the American Journal of Botany. And what they did was they took extracts from different parts of the plant. So the leaves, the fruits, the root. Um, and what they found was from most parts of the plant, you had this allelopathic effect. It's produced by all different parts of the plant. And what it does is it it actually reduces or completely inhibits uh, germination from seeds. This isn't just for other plant seeds. This is for its own seeds. It's It's like black walnut does that too. Oh, I didn't know that black Black walnut walnut is autotoxic. Yeah, so the the leaves and the seed husks, uh, when they fall around the tree, they release this chemical jaglone, or jaglone, however you say it, that prevents other black walnuts from growing. Interesting. I didn't know that black walnuts did that. Yep. So the only part of the plant that didn't reduce germination was the young leaves, so the juvenile leaves of the plant. If there is production of these secondary compounds, these allelopathic compounds, they're not really having much of an effect, or maybe that comes later. Are the roots the most potent part? We'll get to that. Okay. (laughs) The root extracts, when you had a high concentration, um, which is about like 50% concentration, that stopped germination altogether. But when you had low concentrations, like 10 to 20%, that actually helped germination. <laughs> what? So the roots and the young leaves are the only parts of the plant that don't really have an effect or potentially have a positive, positive effect. effect. I just wonder what the, the evolutionary purpose of having a positive effect would be. Yeah, I don't know. That's definitely a case <laughs> where more research is needed. I guess so. Yeah. Did you read at all why the allelopathic effect may be important for the plants? Uh, isn't it to reduce interest? species competition? Right. It's possibly a strategy for spacing out the seed dispersal throughout both time and space. So you want it to be, you want it to disperse further away from the plant. And then when we're talking about timing, you don't want a pokeweed growing up underneath another pokeweed. Right. You only want that to happen after the pokeweed is removed somehow, whether the plant dies or if people people dig it out. (laughs) Freeze up that habitat. Yeah. So the seeds can be in the same space and then you know, uh, activate at different times. And did you read how long these seeds can last in the soil? Yeah, almost 40 years, right? Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. But that's why I've come across somewhere, not in research for this episode, but in reading about pokeweed in the past, that it very often when people are creating a new garden in their yard or land gets disturbed, that all of a sudden pokeweed appears. Mm-hmm. And people are like, where did this come from? Well, the seeds are in the seed bank. Yeah. They've been sitting there for yeah. decades <laughs> just waiting to be disturbed. Yeah. I love that. So I did find uh, two interesting studies about seed dispersal and and, uh, seed predation. Okay. So there was one study from 2005 in the Canadian Journal of Botany that looked at uh, birds that eat the seeds and what effect that has, what effect gut passage has. Mm -hmm. So they looked at uh, mockingbirds and brown thrashers. And they collected a whole bunch of seeds and then they used some as control. They didn't pass them through birds. And then they fed them to brown thrashers and mockingbirds. And they did find that when pokeweed seeds pass through the gut of one of these birds, that it doesn't change the viability. So these seeds will germinate whether they go through a bird or not. Okay. But 
if they go through a bird, they tend to germinate faster. More seeds germinate more quickly when they've gone through a bird. And it was funny, if they went through a mockingbird, they germinated significantly faster than if they were consumed by a brown thrasher. I wonder when that is. I don't know. Uh, it was like half a day faster if they went through a mockingbird, yeah. Um, they didn't really hypothesize on why that was. but. Uh, uh, and then there was another study by actually the same researcher the following year from the Journal of Ecology. You know, there's not a ton of pokeweed out there, right? When you see it, mm -hmm. it's kind of scattered. As you were just talking about, it's kind of broadly distributed in time and space. Mm -hmm. is he was saying, is it limited by the birds that are dispersing the seeds? Or is it limited by seed predation? They did a couple of experiments... Uh, at the same time where they, they scattered seeds in a whole bunch of plots to mimic birds dispersing the seeds. Mm -hmm. And then they also set up these little um, exclosures where they kept seed predators out and then areas where they encouraged seed predators. Okay. And what they found is that birds are dispersing them, uh, but it doesn't seem to be a limiting factor in how many pokeweeds develop. So it, it's not a, a limiting factor in recruitment. Oh, okay. But seed predators... From this study, they are a limiting factor. Is that as soon as pokeweed seeds are kind of available and near the surface, many of them are gobbled up by seed predators, hmm. um, especially mice, they say. So the study concluded that because many species are capable of maintaining a persistent seed bank, because in the seed bank, as we just said a few minutes ago, there's a lot. Of, there's going to be a lot of pokeweed. Mm -hmm. Many species are consumed by seed predators and many species only germinate near the soil surface. So predators may play an important role in shaping the distribution of plants other than pokeweed. Wow. So they were trying to look at pokeweed and kind of use it to explain limited distribution of other plants as well, that seed predators, like mice and critters like that, mm -hmm. may play a pretty big role in how many of these plants we see in the landscape. You've never seen big stands of pokeweed, have you? Only growing in groups together. Are they... Clonal? No. The main way that pokeweed is spread is through seed germination. So when we see groups of pokeweed... Those are individual like, plants. Like what we had seen earlier, th there was at least five stalks there coming out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So you think those are all separate plants? I do. I didn't see any references to uh, reproducing vegetatively. Either did I. That's, yeah. why, that's why I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so do you have any more? Well, the only thing I, I thought I'd want to mention is... I did find two studies on phytoremediation. When you're using plants to do restorative work on an area. Right, yeah. so pokeweed is a hyper accumulator of manganese. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. So for some reason, if you plant pokeweed or it grows where there's high levels of manganese in the soil, it pulls that out of the soil. Holy cow. And then it, it'll dissipate within the plant. They think it has something to do with it binds with the oxalic acid in the plant. Mm -hmm. There were two studies, one from 2013 and one from 2014, and both of them talked about how it could be used uh, in manganese mines or areas that are polluted with manganese. That's awesome. Yeah, it was cool. And it's cool that it's a native, too, so we can use a native... Uh, well, one of these it's called actually... a life hack, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> one <of these> Literally, <laughs> you're using life to fix the situation, right? Now, one of these is actually from China, though. Uh, and they said, what? <laughs> that was my tisk, tisk, tisk. Why are you tisking me? I'm kidding. <laughs> You're saying I'm being racist? <laughs> no, I'm I'm being species -ist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Pokeweed can pull out manganese, but also cadmium, too. Oh, okay. And then there was one study that, again, like the, the beta science, it was a little beyond my, uh, sure, my expertise, sure. but it was talking about uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Okay. And how in one mine, they found these very unique varieties of mycorrhizal fungi growing with pokeweed. And it seemed to be saying that pokeweed in the presence of manganese, you'll also get these highly unique varieties of mycorrhizal fungi that you're not going to find in other places. That's awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> that's really like, cool. Very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. All right, so that's probably it. Yeah. Uh, so I think maybe we should summarize the things we found interesting overall. Sure. So it's this plant. You're not going to find a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But when you do find it, it has these incredibly visually striking berries. Yep, that are forcing the plant to droop like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Yep, and birds love the berries. They're going to be spreading them all over the landscape, helping mm -hmm. them with migration. They have an allelopathic effect, stopping yep. their own seeds from growing in the exact same area. That's right. Yep. Uh, it can be used to help pull some toxins out of the soil. Manganese. You don't want to eat it. 
Nope. Unless you're someone who knows how to make poke salad. And I have heard that you can eat the young shoots, mm -hmm. but they have to have no red on them at all. Yeah. And there is one thing I think is, is good to wrap up with is that if you look into, you know, what is this plant's typical habitat, there was one study, or I'm sorry, one researcher looking into pokeweed that said, nowhere does pokeweed seem to be part of a stable plant association. And he believed that in its foremost habitat before pioneer land settlement mm -hmm. was open stream bank woods, where you'd have these streams that were constantly shifting and creating new open ground. When rivers and streams snake. Right. Yeah. And he was thinking that that's probably where this plant evolved. Okay. Um, and then over time, it's just developed to grow in disturbed ground. It's this weird native that doesn't really seem to have a true home anymore. Yeah. You, know, you just find it in strange places. Yeah, you know, when I think of disturbed sites, I usually think of something relating to humans. Yeah. But disturbed sites, that's just as natural as anything else. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to wrap up the episode. Or so we thought. At this point, Bill and I decided that we wanted to wrap up talking about pokeweed in the presence of the plant itself. The only group of pokeweed we had seen was in the middle of a field, but we were worried about picking up the wind on the mic. Fortunately, the recording was good enough to use, and the wind wasn't too distracting. So here's the clip. Okay, so we're actually at the plant now, and this is the exact same spot that I'd taken pictures last year. So and this so, is probably the same plant. Now I you think were, so. You were saying before that you were wondering if this plant is multiple plants, or do you think it's just multiple stems coming from one rootstock? Yeah, I wanted to know if the plant was clonally producing sprouts, or if these are all separate plants that are just growing in a bunch like this. Right. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, looking here now. I, mean, I still have the same question. Too hard to tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know it has an extensive root system, and right. I, I don't and that know. that taproot is huge. Yeah, yeah. Six inches across. We can see the, the bunches of berries here. Yeah. Like you were saying, I'm holding a, uh, a raceme of berries in my hand. Mm -hmm. So what would you say? It's about three, four inches long, about an inch wide, mm -hmm. and there's at least a few dozen berries on here. The ones near the base of the raceme are deep, dark purple. Most ripe, yeah. Yep. Actually, it's even worse than that. Some of them are shriveled already, yep. so some of them are even past the point where they're all plump and blueberry-like. Yep, those are the, the ones nearest the base. Yep. And then as you work your way up to the, the tip of the raceme, they get uh, less purple and more green. Mm -hmm. And at the very tip, there's like the remnants of a flower. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. They balloon so much. They do get big. <laughs> yeah. And the crazy part, though, is it's what, October 29th? Yes. And we still have berries developing on oh, this Oh, yeah. yeah. Young, young, immature berries yeah. that uh, are going to be ripe. It's going to be a little well while, into right? November. Yeah. So I did read that what happens is once uh, they go through several frosts, mm -hmm. the berries are ruptured and then they just start to dry up. Gotcha. So. Any straggling migrants we still have will be stopping here. Right. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a big field right now. We're in the middle of a big open meadow. This is an old fence row, mm -hmm. which obviously a bird would have perched on. It's probably... right by a beautiful perch spot. Yeah. So yeah. some bird uh, pooped out the seeds, who knows how long ago. Yep. And this big, beautiful pokeweed developed. You know, right now, the pokeweed is a beautiful pinkish, roseish type color. Kind of, uh, d does it remind you at all of like rhubarb maybe? Definitely. But unlike rhubarb from the base all the way up to the leaves it's that color and you said it, it tastes a lot like rhubarb too or no, i didn't say that <laughs> so, <laughs> try it Steve. yeah so um it doesn't at all don't eat it and in the winter time it'll be a, like a light brown kind of like a tan sort of like this skeleton of a plant but it'll still be here it will it just sort of dies back but it's still it'll die back to the yeah. rootstock so mm -hmm. next year you'll get a whole new... But, but we would still find a pile of this stuff if yeah. we came back later in the season, even under the snow. Into the winter time, yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. I'm glad we found it. Yeah, I'm glad we're actually here looking at it while talking about yeah. it. All right. Cool. And now we transition back to the safety of the woods to wrap up the podcast. But before we do that, I want to give a special thanks to our patrons, Alyssa and Lee. You helped make this podcast possible, and Bill and I are extremely thankful for your support. Now back to the show. Okay, we have a few people we want to thank for giving us reviews on iTunes. Yes, thank uh, you. Yeah, in October we got three reviews. All right. But zero on Stitcher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not pandering to that audience enough, as Apparently it turns not. out. Yeah. So we really want to thank Bobcat Brad. Awesome name. I love Such it. Such a cool name. Always Wandering New Jersey, which I think we follow on Instagram. I think that's, that might be the same person. And also Molly Goldsmith. 
thank you guys so much for your reviews. Uh, you really help us be more noticeable on the charts. Yeah, and, that's right. So and, any reviews, rating us or writing a review, it helps us make us more visible on iTunes, helps more people find mm -hmm. the podcast. I think I said this before, but our goal is to get to 25. That's just a nice round number. And what are we at now? Nine or ten. Wow. All right, folks. So by next episode, by episode 13... Let's try to get us up to 15. Ooh. And if you do that for us, uh, Steve and I will do something special in the next episode. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. So we also <laughs> want to encourage people, if you want to uh, support the podcast in a really helpful and meaningful way, uh, consider joining our growing list of Patreon supporters. And mm -hmm. where can they do that, Steve? At patreon.com forward slash the field guides. Yeah. Really helpful, folks. We want to thank the people that have done it already. And also, uh, when we do make enough money on Patreon, we are going to donate to Kiva as well. That's right. We love getting feedback. We love getting ideas for episodes. So if you have feedback, the number one place to give it is in an iTunes review. But you can also, <laughs> <laughs> or Stitcher review, but you can also email us. And you can email us at uh, thefieldguides at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. So just thefieldguides at gmail.com. And you can check out our Facebook page. And mm -hmm. you can also check out our Instagram feed. Steve does a wonderful job of maintaining that. What's the uh, Instagram tag there? At Field Guides Pod. Okay. Now, do we want to talk about Twitter? <laughs> do you want to talk about Twitter? <laughs> so that's supposed to be my job to get our Twitter feed up and going. What's our Twitter handle? At Field Guides Pod. Yeah. So check that out. We'll be uh, putting more tweets up on that soon. Yeah. I just hate saying that. And if Bill doesn't, I, I might start soon. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, thanks for listening. Yep, thank you very much. And we'll see you next month. Oh, before I forget. Oh, boy. Okay, we'll see you next time. Bye, folks. <laughs>